Okay, so now we're in the Bimbal Kirtan. How many of you here have seen Doctor Who? How many are Doctor Who people? No, you guys are smiling, but you never saw Doctor Who? Oh, my God. <laughs> Doctor Who is the oldest sci-fi TV series that exists, older than Star Trek, British. And in the old days, it was very low tech. And one of the bad guys, one of the super bad guy groups, which is still in the new, more recent sort of higher tech ones, BBC thing, um, they're really very high tech now. Robots, or a robot race, but they have human brains implanted in them. Like Ray Kurzweil wants to do it out at Stanford <laughs> in 2045. He wants to put all of us in robots. Because then we won't have any more problems, you know. Like, eternal, we'll all be eternal robots. And he has all these wealthy people supporting him, this complete lunatic neuroscientist. Who's going to, and what it is, is he has a machine that, you know, when you're just at the point of death, it's going to peel your brain like an onion, and it's going to take all the patterns in your brain and plant them in the robot, and then you'll be eternal in the robot. And it says, don't worry, it'll be a soft-skinned biological robot. We won't be clanking into each other. <laughs> this is a real learning. He said, these are loony people who don't want to fix this planet, you know, so they're going to make something else. Anyway, these are called the Daleks, and in those days, originally, the Daleks looked like Hoover vacuum cleaners gone berserk. And they were going around and they had these things and they would go, exterminate, 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 you know, and then Doctor Who would deal with them. But the main thing, I'm sorry, I shouldn't get distracted. Doctor Who is a time lord, what they call a time lord. He comes from the end of this universe, from Gallifrey, which is where the time lords live. And he's the last time lord, except there's one bad guy time lord that he interacts with in some of the earlier episodes. And thousands of episodes there are. And he has nine lives and two hearts. And he sort of comes out through all these tremendous adventures, you know. But the point is, he can visit anywhere in time, and he helps beings on other planets and this planet. And his vehicle is a police box. It looks like a blue London police box, like a phone booth, basically, from outside. But inside, it's huge. It's like has rooms and rooms and laboratories and swimming pools and mansions. It's like enormous inside. And Dr. Ho Do and Vimalakirti's house is like that. Vimalakirti has a house that looks like a regular house in the city of Vaishali, but then thousands of people can go inside the house. And, uh, they know, and then they, they bring thrones into the house from another universe at one point, which are 3,200,000 to leagues tall, come inside the house. And then people, in order to sit on them, to listen to that particular teaching at that moment, they have to make their bodies 40 to 100,000 leagues. A league is about seven miles tall. Yojana is the Sanskrit word. It means the amount of distance that an ox cart can travel in a day, about seven miles, or something, 10 miles. And then there are different, then they have to learn how to suddenly be huge. Like you suddenly change dimensions. And in other words, it's very sci fi, is what I'm trying to say. And it definitely comes from, at, at, at the latest, the, as a piece of literature from the second century of the Common Era, when it was first translated into Chinese. Western scholars make their dating of Buddhist Mahayana texts by basically when the first Chinese translation is made, and then they'll go back 150 years and decide maybe it was there for 150 years before it was translated. They'll, they have a rule of thumb like that, which is completely arbitrary, and they really have no idea. The Buddhists, Mahayana Buddhists anyway, claim that these, this does record events that happened in Buddha's time, and the Mahayana teachings are from Shakyamuni Buddha, but that he purposely suppressed them ahead of time, saying he didn't want them spread widely in India for 400 years, the Mahayana teachings. But that, of course, is totally discredited by modern scholars, because they don't believe anybody would have such a view of life and society and history that they would say something would be appropriate for 400 years later, but it isn't appropriate now. Although, I've, or for your group that I'm teaching, it is appropriate and I'm teaching you. But I don't want it spread widely. So I entrusted it to some beings. I think to merchants, actually. To the merchant class, which was his big class that backed the Buddha. The Brahmins didn't really back him. They were worried about the Buddhist monks competing with them. 
And the warriors thought Buddha, who was a warrior class, a king class, royal class, thought he was a traitor to his class, you know. He was like starting all these nonviolent monks wandering around instead of conquering, you know, and having a good army and all this, like his dad wanted him to do. So, so Westerners won't believe in that. So you can take your pick of the different views. I personally agree with the Buddhists, and I think this Vimalakirti is known. He's known as someone who was a wealthy layman of Vaishali in the Buddha's time from all the different versions of Buddhist, Buddhist history. But that he was such a person as this, and as recorded in the sutra. How many of you found on the website uh, the text of the sutra in English? How many? Only one person? Two? Three? Well, you've read it before, Vimalakirti, right? So this was a really popular sutra obviously in India. It was not particularly popular in Tibet, although it was known. Of course, they had it translated. It was very popular in China, Korea, and Japan. And various emperors and people wrote commentaries on it, and they were really fond of the Vimalakirti. Dogen, the famous Zen master, he very much respects Vimalakirti, although he complains about Vimalakirti uh, sometimes, that he wasn't respectful enough to the monks. Because the Vimalakirti is very famous and that he's a layman, but he's always teaching the monks, even the high enlightened monks within the Theravada view, you know, who are the Buddha's closest disciples, who are arhats already, meaning sort of saints. But they have a dualistic worldview, and Vimalakirti is always questioning them. And if you read the sutra, so not many, most of you have not read it, right, the sutra. So if you read the sutra, you will see that he's, he's always in dialoguing with uh, Shariputra, who's considered the closest disciple of the Buddha. If you see paintings or statues of Shakyamuni Buddha, there's two monks on two sides, usually in front of him. One of them is Shariputra, and the other one is Malgyalayana, or Moggallana, as they say in Pali. And uh, so he's very high. He's like St. Peter, you know, Shariputra, for the Theravada people. But for the Mahayana people, he's kind of the epitome of dualistic thinking. Uh, because uh, the Theravada Buddhism is, uh, but not only Theravada, there's 17 or 18 different schools of monk monastic Buddhists in the, in the, in the, in the Buddha's time. And um, they are all considered dualistic. And they're dualistic in the sense that they think nirvana is somewhere else. And they want to get away from this world and get to nirvana. 